So, David, lovely to see you. And um, we've got some pretty important stuff to discuss. So I hope you won't mind if I dive straight in. Um, could you, um, how would you summarize the scale and urgency of the climate crisis and the challenge the world faces? Well, it's obviously the ultimate issue that we have to deal with. And it's accelerating exponentially. And as we see with every phenomenon that has this kind of acceleration, any delay leads to a far greater burden that has to be dealt with. And so I just want to say to everybody that we just have to put all the effort we possibly can into addressing climate and actually several of the other crises that are accompanying it. And um, David, I mean, in terms of the a, f a few specifics, you all know this better than me. Uh, you, you know, the urgency of tackling this is, is clearly great. We're told that by the IPCC that we've got 12 years left to make the necessary changes for global CO2 not to exceed 580 billion tonnes and keep global temperatures below the 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. That's how I, you know, that I've, I've learned that off pat now because it's such an important thing to people to understand. Uh, given the sort of urgent need to, to, to I suppose, decarbonize the world's economy, um, how would you see the prospects of that? Well, we've got a choice. We either continue with the current linear efforts to try to get reductions in emissions and always falling behind what we really have to do, or we look at other ways of getting collective action. And I think that as the urgency increases, so our quest for alternative means of organization and leadership will become more intense. And, and I see signs of it now, really, because COVID has changed the way in which many of us work. And it's led to a far greater valuation of collective energy in action. So if we can get that kind of shift in mindset, and organization and leadership, then we have a chance. But I think if we continue on the current trajectory, we're gonna be very disappointed. Uh, and so let's talk about that question of leadership, David. What, what kind of leadership do we need to, 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 to achieve the changes that need to be made? Well, our image of a good leader is often the person who stands up, inspires, goes out in front, takes the first hit, and then through a lot of kind of good organization and quite a lot of bravado, pulls everybody along. But I think that for all sorts of reasons, that approach, even that concept, just will not be the way we'll get through. And so I favor an approach that's first of all, recognizing the importance of systems and the interaction of systems. And secondly, that recognizes that it's networks of people that make a difference. And it's the strength of those networks that comes from multiple, what they sometimes call weak links that will make the changes happen. And I'm, I'm not pessimistic about this, Fiona, really because of what I've seen happening through COVID. Well, let's just talk about COVID then, because that is the thing on everyone's minds it's made such a huge difference to everyone's individual lives and to to, to the entire uh, society around the world um tell us a bit more about how covid has changed the conversations about climate change well i'm not sure that everybody's found a way to make sense of covid yet and so things are shifting really rapidly but in, in a nutshell, 
It's that recognition that all the systems on which we depend are themselves interdependent. So we've had a disturbance as a result of this really horrible virus, an ethically challenging disturbance because its mortality is relatively low and discriminating in a, an unpleasant way, really. And it's, it's been a tough one to handle. If it had been a more lethal virus, or if it had perhaps started in a different place, then it could have turned out differently. But this is what we've got, and this is what we have to deal with. And I think that it's brought out in many people a sense of the importance of working together. And the obvious ways with the, the scientific advancements that have been extraordinary. And the less obvious ways with the public health networks that have been so important. But then ways that we're just beginning to find about the importance of community, the importance of the kind of leadership that brings people together in, uh, with an energy that perhaps they didn't know they had. So I'm, I'm seeing it and I'm marveling because it's, it's coming out in unusual places. And I suppose that's what gives me such a lot of confidence. We just might be able to shift the way we approach climate. We were all, I think, slight stunned, I think is the better best word, or, and marvelling at the way in which the world stopped with COVID in those days, certainly speaking for the UK at the beginning of the middle of March, then onwards, blue skies, birdsong, um, you know, just slowing down the quiet. Yep. Um, we, we did that because, although you quite rightly say it, it's not a lethal virus and that's problematic, but it, it, it sort of clearly we had to, that had to happen i mean i don't think it was yes. somehow, no doubt about no it. choice no choice really so how can we get that same sense of no choice around what needs to happen for climate change and people talk about it being this this slow the worst possible crisis facing the world because it's it yep. doesn't not evident we, we it's happening so slowly like a lobster in a bottle bucket of water we're just sort of getting used to what how things are and we don't see what needs to happen to change but how could we inject that that sense of no choice Well, that's, I suppose, my feeling that the COVID ev evolution, particularly what will come in the next year, will give us no choice. I've, I've wrestled a bit with this, Fiona, because kind of early on in COVID, I thought that world leaders have no choice. They've got to work together because it's such a massive issue. It's blindingly obvious that you can't, deal with it with fragmentation, especially between major powers. And then we've had this extraordinary dislocation of the multilateral system, just when you needed it to work together as one. I mean, for the sake of everybody, but particularly for poorer countries, it, it demonstrated abject failure. And, um, you know, that's been the tough part. And I suppose I'm now thinking as we go into 2021 with certain things changed, that there's a chance that, that, that the kind of collective action, network leadership between world leaders might, might actually happen. And if we can get it on COVID, then we can get it on climate. I mean, the COVID challenge is the two big ones that will really test us. But firstly, the fact that the, the virus is continuing to spread and, and in some countries there's going to be some really tricky challenges. And secondly, the vaccine and the prospect of a really stark choice that we have a quite limited global availability of effective vaccine that's been considered safe. Do you offer that vaccine to 
whole populations of wealthy nations? Or do you offer that vaccine to the global population of people who are most at risk? And your answer is? Well, my answer is that we're going to have to find a way to navigate between both, both pools. You can't create a sort of alternative reality where the rich countries will feel they have to guarantee that their people can get whatever vaccines available. That's obvious, I think. Uh, and the they... alternative pull of, of equity, which or what I'm calling vaccine equity, and I think others are as well, that's so important for the future because generations to come will find it hard to forgive a sort of vaccine grabbing by wealthy nations if it's really stark. And David, you, you, you said that the, this collapse of multinational, nat, multi, um, internationalism, I've sorry, suddenly lost the word, um, multilateralism. Yeah. Um, uh, in the in the in the first few months of the COVID pandemic, and perhaps even now, and you said that things have changed, and I'd like to just examine that more. And also, as you as you seem to be implying that that unless we get the global equity side of things for climate change, um, we won't succeed. Is that that seems to be what you're saying? Yeah. The rich nations have got to got to compensate, if you like, the poorer nations and help them. Is that would you say that's a, a crucial thing? Actually, it's interesting you brought that up. That, that I, I think that the perception of the need to focus on equity and justice as being central to really serious action on climate change has been evolving actually quite a lot since Paris in 2015. I was really impressed to when uh, the Secretary General of the UN went to Katowice a couple of years ago and emerged saying that as far as he was concerned, climate change is, an, is really is an issue of, of justice, social justice. And uh, I think that, that he really strongly stood up to the world and said, unless we take account of the tens of millions of people whose lives are now being affected by climate change and that will increase exponentially, he said, so it'll soon be many hundreds of millions. But he said, unless we take that seriously, we have no chance of working well on climate. And I, I think we've had the same stark discovery on COVID, which is a disease that really hits poor communities so hard. And it, and it, it, it really is hard to also for people in poor communities to deal with. And so, in a way, on both issues, on climate and on public health, there is this growing sense that without more attention to equity, there's just no way that the world will deal with them properly. Now, will that become a, a kind of perspective that enters into the collective leadership? I'm not sure. Uh, obviously, there's... I understand, when we, I don't want to say it for certain, but there's a change uh, anticipated in the United States, and that will make a huge difference. But it's not going to be enough. I think that it's going to have to be quite a significant shift in, in the mindset and value set of uh, a large chunk of leaders that will then be accompanied by the other force that's emerging, which is networking among so many different groups of people across disciplines, just recognizing that, that we have to work together on these issues. Because if we don't work together, they will get the better of us. Seen it with COVID so starkly. And David, where, where do you see that type of new leadership, that type of new networking emerging? Actually, that, that's something that I keep sort of troubling myself with. Can I find a pattern? Can I categorise it? Can I even find a nice way to describe it? And the answer is, I know it's emerging because I am seeing 
to such amazing collaborations. And, and they're not all the expected ones. I'm seeing people in business, private sector, in business and in civil society and different parts of government, local authorities working together quite unusually uh, on, for example, on issues related to the dislocation of, of food chains as a result of COVID or the upset to employment or the challenge of, uh, of, of trying to look after very large groups of people in residential care and so on. And, and I'm just seeing in, in innovation and imagination, interdisciplinary working and working between professions and between organizations, different ways of working in business. I'm seeing them coming up everywhere that I look. I see them with people I work with in Africa. Obviously, I, I don't see them physically. It's so often through, through Zooms and teleconferences. But I'm seeing them also in universities. I'm seeing them very much in businesses and, and, and they're all sorts of different sectors. And so I'm, and, and I'm not the only one, by the way. I think there are many of us who are spotting the emergence of, of different styles of being and working. And, and, and we also recognize that it's not just because our lives are dislocated because of the virus, it's because uh, we're beginning to see that on this, with this kind of enormous challenge that we all find it hard to make sense of, that we just have to be ready to work differently. Lots of different things, I think, and my hypothesis, okay, is that people are generally being kinder to each other. My hypothesis is that they are prepared to perhaps take some not so much bigger risks in terms of who they'll talk to or what they'll say, but just that they're, they're prepared to explore different ways of looking at things. And okay, so like, like quite a lot of people who've worked on climate, I'm a stubborn optimist. I think you have to be to do this. That's, that's where, it, where I'm feeling right now, is that new ways of thought, action, organization, joint working are emerging, and, and that gives me a lot of strength. Younger, younger generations have, are taking, uh, playing an enormously important part in this. Um, I mean, forgive me for saying, but David, you and I are of a certain age, and, and, and <laughs> I feel a sense of... of um, responsibility you know for, 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 for where the, the world is now I mean we didn't do yep. it all ourselves but we've lived very you know many of us privileged lives and and and, and that, that we do have a sense of responsibility but should we how can we be helpful uh, uh, you know we don't we can't own this it has to be owned by the by the people coming through but uh, and they're doing a fantastic job what, what is what is the role of people like us who want to help um, but mustn't get in the way? There's a word that I've, I've really grown to love, uh, the word to mentor. I think that the notion that, that the most exciting relationships we can have in life are often those that involve mentoring, where we offer to help people find a way, but we don't ever uh, assume that we have the right to tell them what that way is. So it's more one of helping others to find a way that suits them, but using what we've picked up in life to identify some stepping stones or to look at ways uh, through to find where we might want to get to. I think we can be helpful with that sort of thing, uh, especially, uh, and I, it's difficult to say this without sounding pompous, but I'll try, especially if we are humble especially if we keep remembering that whatever we might have accumulated in our, in our heads and in our hearts is in itself possibly quite wrong and uh, certainly uh, inappropriate for now compared with when we were younger. So, it, uh, and I noticed I was trying, sort of checking up what is in conversation at St. George's house. And I looked at the bottom and the, the motto of St. George's House is about wisdom. Uh, and I thought to myself, yes, that's perhaps what the mentoring relationship is about. It's sharing, sharing whatever wisdom you might have, but with 
total humility. We, we, none of us can be sure that what we have is necessarily going to illuminate the right paths to the future. And in fact, what is really so awful is that people like you and me really do have to take responsibility for how things are now and for the delays. And whenever anything is exponential, you always look back and you say, we should have acted earlier. That's by d definition what happens. Every time there's an outbreak, people say you should have acted earlier. Every time there's a disaster, they say you should have come in quicker. Well, of course, uh, that's a part of, of dealing with these things that just accelerate all the time. So we'll always say we should have been able to do better, act quicker. And, and I think that we are not only accountable, but we have an absolute duty to share whatever we have in what, whatever way we can offer it for those who uh, have to cope with our legacy. But I haven't worked out in my mind yet what that means. I mean, I'm lucky I've got a university position and I've got a fabulous, fabulous group of colleagues with whom I can think through these issues. But I still haven't quite worked out, to be truthful, what sort of sharing system is necessary for people who might have something to offer in terms of wisdom about thinking in systems and thinking about new ways of organization. How does one share that sort of thing? Not worked it out yet. I'm, I'm a really proud member of a thing called the, the Weaving Lab, which is a WhatsApp group that I've discovered where people who do extraordinary kinds of skillful organizational development and things that that are really not inside any of the sort of normal texts. And I suppose that's how these new ways of thinking and working will emerge. And we won't know in advance which ones are gonna emerge and they'll just come. And then, yeah, people will be able to get on top of these really horrendous crises. And they will, because I'm a stubborn optimist. I'm going to go on saying that until somebody definitely shows me that it's impossible. And David, just about St George's House um, and the networks of leadership um, uh, that, that, that are building there uh, as an example of, of how one can support and strengthen what already exists, how, how, would, you, how would you see that evolving? So hierarchical organisations are not very good as ways of encouraging the emergence of this kind of human-centered systems leadership. Uh, in fact, almost uh, by definition, hierarchical organizations encourage a different kind of conformity, and that's fine, and they, they exist for a reason. But the, they're actually the kind of organizations that will lead to the emergence of alternative and, I believe, the right kind of leadership for the future uh, will come through networks. And there are in this world that people you and I know who are just the most superb networkers. They know that if you invest in connections between people, you create options for incredibly powerful new ways of thought and action to emerge. But it's the, the quality of that connection that is always so important. And there are some who almost effortlessly seem to be really good at connecting with connecting people with each other and creating extraordinary groupings that then just last and do good. I mean, there are some of them I really just all the time marvel at. The, Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, which is this loose network of people from a hundred and something public health institutions around the world, who basically often with relatively small uh, remuneration, perhaps even just expenses because their institutions continue to pay for them, basically do thousands of missions all over the world to deal with disease outbreaks. That's how the World Health Organization really works. It's through these incredible networks that are based on trust and respect and common identity. And uh, 
quite a lot of those kinds of things going and I suppose that I would just if I had the kind of resources that I think and uh, you know would would really help I would you put whatever I could into fostering these kinds of networks and supporting the people who almost self-identify as the great connectors and uh, they're not always at the top of organizations but they're the people who are, I think really will help. It's the people who connect together in communities, connect together in universities, connect together in hospitals, to connect together in all the different institutions that are made up of lots of different people. And they're not always the bosses, but they're the ones who keep the place going. And uh, too often they're not, they're not given sufficient valuation. They never really demand it, but they don't get enough valuation, which means then that others don't always appreciate just how important they are. So perhaps there's a role there for uh, simply identifying those people. They, I mean, they may be well known to those people who are networked with them, yes. but for many others they'll be invisible because of the nature of social media and you know you can yes. get yourself in different tunnels and not see what's out there. So is that a role somehow just to almost find ways to give more visibility to those networks that are functioning really well? It's almost one wants it a special technique to enable the people who are really good networkers to be able to see that at least they themselves are recognized by those by others who are good networkers. It's a sort of uh, a, a way of just enabling self-identification of excellence. I've, I've often thought that, that it's that capacity to really uh, recognize the special people that is so important in our lives and that the normal Val validation systems don't always work. So I'm thinking that through quite a lot. And um, I mean, I, I, I wanted at some point during our conversation this evening, I probably can't really do this, but I wanted to turn it around to you. Because one of the things that I've always admired about the way you work, and uh, uh, what lies behind the way you work is a, an incredible respect for and value for people uh, who, who enlighten others. And, and you've, I think all your life as, an, as a journalist, you've been somebody who, who loves finding interesting and exciting people. And so I think you are one of those who does a bit of that identification. And I suspect that there are, there are many in your profession well, whose, ba whose life is basically made up of finding amazing people, telling their story or giving them space to tell their own story. Well, David, that's very kind, but you're absolutely right. It is, uh, you know, I think I'd like to just talk then about the profession and um, the role of health professionals in, in, this, in this, you know, terrible challenge we face. Um, Robin Stott, um, Hugh Montgomery are two people I'd like to kind of mention as, as, yeah. as fantastic people for connecting. Um, and, and Robin in particular has, is, is wanting to get some demands from health professionals out into the public domain all countries to commit to net zero emissions by 2050 and end to fossil fuel subsidies, a commitment to all health services to chart a path of being net zero as soon as possible. Um, I, I just like your sense, we, we've not got long now, but you know, on this call as well as globally, um, it, it, what, what's your sense about how realistic those sorts of calls are and, and how we can get the health voice? Um, and what, you know, what's the role of health professionals and how can we use oh, that voice? Fiona. Just even if we haven't got very long, let me just say that this year, together with colleagues uh, in uh, one uh, summit called the World Innovation Summit for Health, we've been putting together a piece of work on health in the climate crisis. And our fundamental thesis is that health professionals ought to become the most strident advocates for climate action, both as individuals in their own practices because frankly health health workers themselves can do an awful lot in relation to both mitigation and adaptation but also as leaders and conveners of others either joining processes that others are involved in or themselves taking leadership action and we should develop this index card I, I uh, yeah, the sort of thing that people could carry around their pockets of 10 things that I can do and 10 things that I can help others to do. 
Uh, and um, when we did it, we thought, well, I wonder whether this is a, a, a good thing to do. But we then talked to a number of groups, uh, m medical groups, World Medical Association, WHO, nursing head helped us to get into the nursing communities and, and, and many other groups of health workers. And we suddenly found, without probing too much, that there is a real sense among health professionals that they really matter when it comes to climate advocacy. And, and this is global. This is not just confined to any one geography. And so I haven't found the right way to do it and I'm not, not quite sure what it is, but I would love to stimulate much more outspoken and at the same time measured action. I'm not, I'm, I mean, it's up to people to decide what they want to do and how they want to do it. But I'm, I'm actually advocating right, really quite thoughtful uh, ways of working to just provide greater leadership about the absolute importance of acting now through imaginative leadership and action on climate change. Because unless health actors do it, who else is going to really go for that absolutely central vital position of, of stressing that climate, climate change is about lives, livelihoods, justice, but not just justice for now, it's justice for generations to come. We were talking about young people who called us to account and they've called us to account because they must, because we've not managed to actually act with sufficient energy on this exponential of, of climate action, just like we've failed to really do well enough on pandemic preparedness. So we've, we've really got no alternative but to respond to this. And I suppose that's what I, I would like health actors to do, to speak out and act, not just in their own domains, but with others for the kind of leadership that is necessary to make a difference. Uh, we have in the UK the Health Alliance for, uh, on Climate Change, um, chaired now by Richard Smith, my predecessor, and um, yes. re representing 700,000 health professionals, including all the nurses in the UK. Um, so, you know, that's a, a wonderful group. It, it's still hard to work out the, quite the role. How do we, you know, make that voice heard? We've got COP26 coming up. Uh, there, uh, R Richard Smith trying to make sure and others working around the world, there are lots of groups of health professionals gathering um, and, and the feeling that this is, you know, beginning to be seen as mainstream issues, a mainstream issue for healthcare professionals, which has been a long time coming. And again, as you said, yep. too low. Um, what, what would you see, how can we make that health voice really heard at COP26? I mean, there's been a worry about no women involved, that, that's a worry, in the, in the sort of organisation, the senior organisation of COP26. Where are the health professionals in COP26? I don't know how to do it yet, but uh, actually that's been a big problem and uh, a challenge. Uh, I, I've been talking to some of the campaigners who've been working alongside many of the young people. And they've said, you've got to do a campaign, but it's a campaign that's empowering others to act. So it's a kind of catalytic campaign, all using networks, but you, you need a bit of money to kick it off. And I suppose that that's now, I mean, we, we, we know how much we've got to raise uh, you can't start something like this for, for less than about two million, but we've got to do it and we've got to um, just spare no, no time until we've raised that money. Once you've got that, that, that sort of money, you can take on people and you can then form the, the, the energy hub that you need to, to stimulate a network. The network doesn't need a lot of extra inputs. It will be self self uh, self-supporting in terms of energy and uh, dynamism that we're going to need to trigger it off. And uh, the, 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 the links we have with the different networking organizations of health professionals in every country are showing us that they are not only eager to act, but they're also ready to act in a concerted way. And I think we're here talking about particularly acting within your organization rather than 
sort of acting in the form of protest, because I think there's an awful lot to be done within businesses, within institutions, within universities, within every kind of, of body to just address not just climate, but all the associated exponential crises that are, that are there, particularly the destruction of nature. And of course, the growing inequities that we're having to deal with. So all this is, is not just about working together on climate, though that's at the center of it. It's using that same energy that we will build to work on the other major crises as well. What has been described by many working in this area is the planetary emergency. And I think, I think it's all right. There's one or two people have said to me, if you call it the planetary emergency, it kind of de de it demotivates people, but uh, I'm not so sure. I think that uh, particularly given what I'm hearing from young people, the ones who are really concerned about the legacy for them and for their children and their children's children, that um, we have no choice. And uh, neither you nor I, nor I think uh, obviously the many hundreds of thousands of people who really do care about what the generations to come will inherit, what our grandchildren will inherit, we have no choice. People will and do, I'm sure, feel overwhelmed by the, the challenge, you know, the, the sheer challenge of just carrying on with their lives. They've got busy jobs. Um, we've got COVID. Uh, there's lots of sort of geopolitical issues going on around us. Um, how would you advise people listening to um, gain, gain the, the sort of, to be effective, I suppose, that's the thing, to be effective and um, constructive um, rather than simply saying this is just too big for me I just I just don't know how to contribute well of course the issues if we look at them in a sort of global sense are huge and they are much much bigger than any one of us can possibly hope to do with individually but that's where I think our, our innate humility does come in I think humans by and large uh, have a very clear understanding of their limitations as well as their potential. And so it's that, 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 that we have to start with the humility where we say to ourselves, we are not going to change anything uh, uh, as an individual, but if we learn to connect and work with others and we do it without any hesitation, without conditions, unconditionally in as, as, as much as we possibly can, valuing everybody, then the, the little bit that we all offer will turn into something big. I mean, after all, that's the only way we will deal with COVID in the short term before vaccine becomes available to everybody. And that unfortunately will be a bit of time. So uh, while we're dealing with the virus at the moment, it, we've all had to come to terms with reality that our actions in themselves are minute, but it's that accumulation of the actions of hundreds of millions of people that actually will hold the virus at bay. And the same applies with dealing with climate. It's a tricky one for us because many of us think that, that we're kind of only making a difference if we're able to demonstrate that we've had a huge impact on something. But actually, it's not like that. It, uh, there's a very there's a, a, a fortunate few who can stand up and say, I made a difference, I did this, I discovered that, I led the other. But most of us uh, achieve what we achieve through the connections that either we're able to form with others or we're able to help others form through catalyzing it. So uh, I'm, I'm, I think that most of those with whom I'm in contact are pretty comfortable with the fact that this is going to be work that requires multiple actors working together and the accumulation of lots of small things, but which then taken together will be absolutely massive. And we probably have no idea how massive the impact of our collective working can be. I often say when I'm working with groups that the kind of energy that emerges through a group that really comes together and relates well together is much, much greater than the sum of the parts of the individuals. You get that sort of magical 
uh, exponential growth in energy, sorry, I'm using that word too much, that leads to the emergence of something different. So I, I'm not scared myself if ever anybody says to me, oh, David, the problems are so huge. Uh, how can you possibly do it? I say, well, I'm not going to do it. But if we all pull together, there's no, no stopping us. And I'm such a believer in that. I've seen it happen so often now. David Nabarro, thank you so much for talking to us. It's been a real pleasure. I'll hand back now to St George's House. Thank you. Thank you for this evening. It's been an honour.